Good morning, good afternoon, uh, and even good evening, I believe, uh, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Driving Auto Brands with Purpose. Uh, we are really excited about this topic today. We have a large number of people joining us today from all different industries around the world. So this is obviously a topic that's uh, top of mind for for many of you. And I'm happy to say we have a very capable and uh, panel uh, to lead us through this discussion today. Uh, this is Sumter Cox with Mood Media. I am the uh, the man behind the the curtain, so to speak, uh, driving the the uh, the webinar logistics, uh, but um, I will not be participating in the in the conversation today. Uh, so before we get started, I'd like to go over just a few quick housekeeping items so you know how to participate in today's event. Uh, everyone is listening uh, in using your computer speaker system by default. If you would prefer to join over the phone, just select telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information for you will be displayed. And everyone is in listen-only mode today. Uh, that being said, you will certainly have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenter panel by typing your questions into the questions pane of your control panel. Um, Feel free to send questions in at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. And that's it for housekeeping. Uh, so I would now like to introduce George Gottel of Uxus, who is serving as our capable moderator for today's event. George, take it away. Sumner, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, we'll see how capable I am after the uh, presentation. But uh, as Sumner mentioned, my name is George Gottel. I am the Chief Creative Officer here at Uxus. Uh, we are a strategic uh, design consultancy, uh, reimagining consumer experiences for brands like Shell, Volkswagen, Bentley, uh, big multinationals all over the world. I'd like to introduce our panel today. Uh, we're very excited. We have some wonderful panelists. Um, I'd like to just call your name and then if you could please introduce yourself and a little bit about what you do in your company. Uh, we'll start with Sam. Start with me. Start with me. Call me out. I was, wasn't expecting to be first then. Uh, by the way, I uh, said he was behind the curtain, George. I just wonder whether he was behind behind your curtain. I couldn't help it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, hi, hi everybody, uh, my name's uh, Sam Clark, I'm the Chief Vehicle Officer for GridServe. Um, I think it's a picture of one of our electric forecourts behind me on the, on the wall. Uh, so uh, yeah, we, we're delivering uh, sustainable energy throughout the UK uh, through solar, hybrid solar farms as well as the electric forecourt infrastructure that's uh, being rolled out over the next five years. So uh, we've just launched the first one uh, in Braintree in Essex in southeast of England and, uh, uh, and then we're going to roll out another hundred of them um, around the UK in the next, uh, next three to five years. Um, and that's me. Oh, I've also been driving electric vehicle for nearly 20 years, so I'm reasonably uh, experienced in EV driving as well. Wow, way ahead of the curve. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Uh, Darren. Hi, everybody. I'm Darren Jobling, uh, CEO and one of the founders of Zerolight. And Zerolight uh, currently working with a lot of the world's biggest car manufacturers, people like VW, Audi, Lamborghini, on reimagining their customer journey of the, the customer journey of the future and I suppose the thing that we're most famous for recently is we did the entire connected customer journey for the launch of the new EV the Lucid Air which I think uh, set out a, a nice a nice vision for what the what the world of the future could look like great thank you Darren Seamus Thank you very much. I'm Seamus Walsh. I'm the Enterprise Sales Manager for Automotive at LG Electronics Business Solutions here in Europe. I work with a lot of the world's biggest automotive OEMs, dealership groups, and mostly focused on the uh, digital in-store strategy. So, pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Seamus. And last but not least, Jonathan. Thanks, George. Uh, I'm Jonathan Warrod. I'm Vice President of Global Brands at Move Media. Uh, I work out of the UK and uh, my primary focus is with uh, automotive brands across the world where we're developing strategies to engage and generate compelling retail experience 
Um, I've been with Mood for about three years and for the last 20 years I've been involved with retail strategy and digital. Um, so we're really focused on looking now at the future of the automotive market and how we can help elevate the uh, customer experience. That's great. Well, thank you, gentlemen, first of all, all for being here today. I think we're going to be, we're very excited to hear your insights on uh, some of the topics and questions that we have today. Um, as as uh, Subner mentioned, our topic today is driving autom automotive brands with a purpose. Uh, I think we all know that social responsibility today plays a key role in the perception of brand value for a lot of companies. And customers uh, today are demanding that brands engage with transparency, meaning, and purpose. Today's big question is, how's the automotive industry doing with that? And um, our first topic is sustainability. And, uh, you know, where, what is the auto industry doing with sustainability? There's a lot of talk about, you know, electric hydrogen uh, as alternative energy sources. And obviously that requires a complete uh, kind of, you know, transformation of, of, the, of the landscape in terms of how cars refuel. Uh, and maybe I'd, I'd like to, Sam, because of your expertise, we should maybe start with you on that question. Yeah, sure. Thank you, George. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the whole landscape is changing all the time, isn't it? Um, you know, the, 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 the need for EVs certainly in the UK, uh, it will be um, illegal, effectively, to buy a petrol or diesel vehicle in, in the UK by 2030. So, um, wow. you know, we're making pretty strong strides towards driving, uh, you know, a sustainable future. And I think the automotive industry is, is recognising that, certainly in the UK, that, you know, that they need to do things differently. Um, and whether that be from uh, from the production of those vehicles you know, through to the, through to the actually delivery of them and the, and the zero tailpipe emissions, I think there's a there's a huge a huge drive now to, to to produce for most of the OEMs, not all of them. Some of them are still a little bit stuck in the hybrid world, but but most of them are recognising the the need for a fully EV future, um, and that's why we're building these forecourts to support that EV future. Um, we, we all know about Tesla; they've done a very good job, not just in the vehicles, but also in the infrastructure they've created to support that those vehicles. Um, but as it stands today, and this may change according to the to the, uh, the rumor mill, but at the moment the Tesla supercharger network is just for Tesla. Um, you know, we need we need infrastructure now that supports everybody else, and that's part of what we're trying to build um, to try and help support those those OEMs because they, they can produce electric vehicles all day long, but they don't actually necessarily have the infrastructure to go with it yet. So so we we're helping with that bit of the journey to try and create certainly in the UK the, the mass uptake we're all expecting over the next few years. Yeah, certainly there's a, going to be a big transformation. I mean, as we heard uh, General Motors, one of the biggest manufacturers in the world, is switching over to purity electric going forward. So um, I think uh, the consumer experience also at the at the refueling point uh, or recharging point at this point uh, is going to be completely different because of, of the experience overall. So uh, when we're talking about uh, the transformation of an industry, uh, Darren, maybe a question for you would be, uh, what are the threats and opportunities for the automotive industry? What are some of the things you see? And, and of course, uh, gentlemen, please chime in on, 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 on your insights as well on that question, because I think that's a big one to answer. Yeah, th yeah thanks, George. I, I think, I think for, it's really interesting. I think the, obviously the automotive industry is making, in terms of the earlier question on, 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 on EVs, I suppose that to be a little bit contentious, you could also say how much is that has been driven by people like Tesla? How much is it reactionary versus how much was it planned? Which I think is an, an, interest, an interesting concept. I think in terms of the, it's a difficult time to be a car manufacturer. They seem to be facing a number of, of things, if you like, attacking them. And they need to get their, their, their sort of thinking straight fairly quickly. So, so I think in, in, in terms of what we do, we see a great amount of removal of silos in the sales and marketing experience. So a lot of the way the automotive is set up, they have a lot of different silos. Say somebody does dealerships, somebody does the internet, somebody does advertising. And the biggest challenge for the OEM is to connect those up with data. And I think what we're going to see is pretty much the OEMs need to work on making retail more like online and online more like retail until the two until the two connect. So I think that's a that that's a pretty that's a pretty major challenge, especially as you have a lot of other format holders, say platform holders, coming in and eyeing this very very uh, very interestingly. 
You know, I think it was uh, Frost and Sullivan said that online and aftermarket sales were going to be worth 605 billion by 2025. You know, that's an interesting that's an interesting market to attack. And in some ways, it reminds me of my own personal background is in the games industry. And there was a big transformation in the games industry where they used to sell computer games on Sony, PlayStation and Xbox in a retail store. And then they were stuck when people started to move online. And really, I think the, the Sony's and the Microsoft's weren't necessarily as aggressive as they should be in terms of in terms of embracing you know these new say digital distribution methods so i think it's it's tough to be a car manufacturer at the moment i think they're they're beginning to think in the right direction but they really need to fight the right battles currently uh if they fight the wrong battles they'll be in real difficulty and, and where do you think the sticking points are darren because I'm, I'm i'm interested because from our point of view looking at the, going back to the retail conversation um, about how the brands are engaging with their customers. At what point in the journey are you seeing that that sticking point? Because we, we see that from a, a, a physical to online point of view about trying to draw that digital experience into the physical spaces and make them more dynamic. I think you're looking at it, are you from, from the other direction, from the online to the, to the physical? But where do you see those sticking points in, in that journey? I, I think for me, it's all down to personalization. So people judge their, say, buying journey regardless of vertical. So uh, if you look at each one of us, we'll have a different Amazon homepage personalized to us. You'll have a different Netflix page. You'll have a different Spotify list. It's all using data to personalize it. And if I turn up at a car manufacturer site, you're going to spend £30,000 on a new vehicle. It's crazy, really, that they don't know very much about me. And everybody, regardless whether you're going to spend 100,000 or 5,000, you have that same impersonal experience. So I think that's one of the one of the big challenges. Somebody who, say, a platform holder could come along and personalize that experience and snatch some of that business out of the hands out of the hands of the OEMs. And I, I think, think one of the, it, a new opportunity there as well, which is to create an entirely different business model. And what we're seeing is, it was mentioned earlier, the new entrants to the market who are developing uh, predominantly electric vehicles, but they are not the traditional players, no legacy, who are starting to trial some of these different business models. And I think we'll see that be a driver for a lot of it, because it's going to find a whole new source of data. So if you look at uh, membership models, which is you know going a step beyond what went from selling a car leasing a car now you become a member of a club which is about more than just owning a vehicle it's about what you do with it um and so i think that's going to create a much broader um realm of data that, that the oems will have access to um, but it's going to support additional revenue streams as well through it so that is where i see the opportunity but absolutely agree with where the challenge is right now yeah, I think I think definitely with with automotive automotive manufacturers, the problem is currently these silos all have different agencies with different end dates, and they can't actually sync them up. So so what happened with Lucid is they came to see us at CES in the January, but they didn't have they didn't have anything in place at that stage. It was all it was green field. So they can put in something that's revolutionary totally out of the out of the gate because they don't have to deal with with all the legacy stuff. And I think that's that that's why I think the, the EV manufacturers can look look as if they're so far ahead because they can just just implement it and it's all digital. I think um, I mean that, that brings us to our, our next question, which I think is really intriguing, especially off the back of what you just said, Darren, about personalization. Um, and, you know, looking at our panel today, we are all pretty homogenous, <laughs> so I hate to say it. Uh, but, you know, in, in the future, obviously, and, and what you were saying earlier, Seamus, about, you know, be, being part of community-based kind of uh, brands that have values and that reflect the values of, of that group. Uh, how is the auto industry doing with inclusivity? I'm going to open that up to the whole group uh, because I think it's a very important topic that other sectors are way ahead on uh, and the auto industry 
being primarily male driven and male based kind of industry, how is that going to then include women, uh, people with physical challenges, um, you know, those those types of aspects? I think I could take a stab at, at, at kind of answering that. And I think it, it comes down to the presentation of the product and the presentation of the service. I think traditionally uh, the automotive sector has been very much based around technical capability. Um, and when we look at the, the new vehicles coming out, that especially with the electric vehicle, um, that technical requirements of knowledge are, are very much removed from the selling experience. Um, that the whole experience becomes more about what does the user want? Um, what selection does the user, uh, the client, uh, want to take in their choice of vehicle? So I think you know, that, that will get broken down. And I think to, to the point that Darren was making around bringing in that, that more streamlined sales approach and, and seeing the, these OEMs moving quicker to present products in a way which is about the experience of the brand rather than the, the technical capability. I think that's going to break a lot of barriers down. And, and then, of course, you've got the ability to select. And, and with uh, a lot of the work that the OEMs are doing now, especially where we're working around choice and selection, uh, building tools and capability that enable that short choice and selection to be had, rather than just taking an off-the-peg vehicle, that, that's going to be a very important part of that market, I think, going forward, about how we make the product uh, more inclusive for, for, for all users. I think that's a very good point that you just brought up about the shift from a kind of, uh, you know, a pragmatic or rational way of shopping for something or purchasing something to a more engaged emotional level of purchase. So more like, you know, the fashion and beauty industries, which are more obviously focused towards female consumers um, and, and how that's going to affect then the purchase of automobiles. Would anyone else like to comment on that? Because I think it's a very important topic that's very significant. Yeah. Yeah, I think one thing that Jonathan made a point there around around selection is actually, um, you know, looking at the automotive industry and EV specifically, it's quite complicated. Like the vehicle itself is quite is quite simplistic in the way that it works, and that's great. Um, but there are so many different types of connection types, so many different charger speeds, uh, uh, usable batteries, kilowatt hours. There are there's a number of different variables that that, that need to be selected, if you like, um, in terms of which vehicle choice you want. Not not let alone I'm going from an internal combustion engine to an EV, and that's a huge leap, and I don't know enough about it. And so I don't, and I've done hundreds of webinars this year, and I don't think I don't think I've not, I think I've said education in every single one of them because education now is is absolutely in, vital not just for the consumer but also for the OEMs themselves to understand better educate themselves on how best to sell this this, this newfangled product that we're all looking at uh, implementing over the next decade so I think there's an inordinate amount of selection but also education that's required to understand what what these next steps of these journeys are going to be it's a big leap going from a petrol car to an electric one or, or buying that vehicle through a different mechanism or, or means and Darren made a really interesting point earlier, which I, I didn't. I think we've done without realizing it, perhaps, is that the online going offline and offline, you know, that, those two, those inverses. We've got digital touchscreens physically on site, which do the same thing as your web browser does. But similarly, on the on the other side, we've got we've got ways in which you can virtually go around our site without being there. You know, that whole sort of journey of trying to stitch these things together. It's a whole new, it's a whole new world, really, and, and a new way of presenting information, educating people. And getting to make purchasing decisions in a way that isn't going to a local dealer and being sold the cheapest diesel outside you know it's it's completely different now and I, I think i think generally people underestimate the level of complexity of a vehicle and how sometimes you need the reassurance from another human being to get you over that to explain the features of the vehicle and a lot of car manufacturers think that hey if i just add buy it now to my website people will be able to be able to purchase but in actual fact you need to it's like how do you how would you sell the vehicle when the salesperson wasn't there how can how can you use technology to do that and understand the features because they are quite complex beasts yeah we just received a question from the audience that maybe it's the speaking about sales and i'll just read the question directly uh do the panel think dealer groups will start uh will start have a part to play by 2030, given VW's recent move to an agency sales model move for the ID3. Would anyone like to respond to that question? <laughs> yeah, I think I, I, I think from a from a per, from a personal point of view, I think yes, dealers need to evolve, but they still have a role to play. No doubt. So so, so and, and we do obviously we do a lot of work, and I think what what's going to happen is. 
you're going to have this flexibility where you can start online, purchase online, start in a dealer, purchase in a dealer, and any combination. So in actual fact, I think VW um, with bringing in the agency model is 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 acknowledging that the dealers do play a vital part in in the whole ecosystem, but also rewarding the dealer. So, so if somebody might come to the dealership and have a have an experience or or, or in the dealership. But they might go and buy that car online, and still that dealer needs to be rewarded for that for for the part that they've played in that in that journey. So I think it's quite a smart move. And I think yeah. we're seeing that happening in in across brands. I think where they are uh, starting to look more at that agency model, um, and and how does that dynamically transform that dealership experience, and what then is the responsibility for the dealer versus the OEM, and does the OEM take more investment? Um, because they're presenting their brand um, uh, where the dealer then provides a, a more emphasis on service and, and delivery. Yeah, I, I was about to, was about to say, um, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm reasonably new to this part, sort of part of the sector, but I'm not so sure the dealers, the, yeah, I, I, I don't know whether I fully agree with Darren or not really, but, but my understanding, you know, we, we lease vehicles now, you know, we have, a, we have a, a lender and underwriter that's providing the capital in order to lease those vehicles to our own customer. The dealer is just really the delivery guy now. The, the, the customer's not going anywhere near a dealership. Well, that sort of shiny marble and big glass and lots of, lots of nice stuff is completely irrelevant. I, I'm not too sure what rally that gives anymore. You know, that's not, people aren't going there to do that anymore. It's better, I mean, like so Tesla and, and Polestar, Polestar don't have any, any, any showrooms of any kind. There isn't a dealership network, you know, and that, and there's no legacy of having to do it another way either. So I, I don't, I, you know, aside from them being the sort of delivery port of the physical vehicle, it, going rolling rolling forward maybe ten years, I, I'm not entirely sure the relevance of, of shiny dealerships on the corners of roundabouts anymore. I think that the, the, the definitely the definitely need to evolve. That's that's you know the, 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 what you consider to be a, a dealer now will evolve. So say even something like Lucid, that's obviously electric online, they still have they've still invested quite heavily in having these Lucid studios that are sort of like de de dealers, dealerships of the future that are more experiential. So so but I think you hit the nail on the head when you said hey, hey there's there's I don't know the exact percentage, but I know a lot of cars are purchased now currently by a lease. And but you did say seventy percent only... there. Yeah. So, so 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 yeah. So, so but you did say, hey, I see the only time I see the dealers when they deliver the car. So you, you have to think about, you know, if the dealer's not there, who's gonna do who's who's actually gonna do that? And it's it's a major problem for the automotive manufacturers to have to deal with. You know, that the, it's it's a whole network of getting the stock out into the uh, across the country and the whole logistics of that as we saw with tesla isn't to be isn't to be underestimated i think there's, there's almost more to it than that where right now the perception among a lot of consumers is that a dealer is a barrier or an obstacle that sits between them and the brand they're buying into and so what we'll see over time is that certain dealers and dealership groups will move closer to the OEM, where they will incorporate a lot more um, technology um, and solutions such as those provided by Darren at Zero Life that really do tightly bind that dealership into the, the different silos that make up the OEM and others who are going to move away. And the ones who move away will be much more like a grid serve environment we're actually, yes, it's new cars and it's leasing, but it's multi-brand. And so you're addressing perhaps a different type of consumer. So the first, the former type will be more branded and there'll be a way for OEMs to really enhance whatever is the messaging of their brand and focus on a specific target customer group. And the latter are gonna be much more broad in mass market and they may end up being more numerous. One way or another, whether we call it a dealership, a space, a club, a studio, a store, they're performing essentially the same role that they are about transacting vehicles. Um, and I think there's going to be a lot more things happening around that as well. I think you bring up a really good point, Seamus, because I also I think it's a generational thing. You know, a guy like me growing up in LA buying cars, I'm used to just dealership versus a first time young 
you know, zillennial even, you know, purchasing a car, they're not used to anything. They can be, they're open to any kind of new type of experience and probably seek out something other than a dealership. Which, which brings me to our next question, is the auto industry going at the right pace? And uh, Jonathan, I'd like to pose that question to you um, and open it up to the group. Yeah, sure. And I think that's a, it's a good question. Um, and I think it's one that we, we look at when we speak to OEMs and think about how are they positioning themselves in the market? Um, we know that the technology is moving quickly. Uh, you know, the move to EV, as Sam said, is, is going to happen, especially here in the UK and, and around the world really quickly. Um, and I think when we look at the development of the network and the, the experience that you have with an automotive brand today, um, we see that there is different paces in different organizations in terms of their connected customer channel. Uh, so if we talk about the, the pace of change uh, within the automotive industry, we see that there are some that are moving quickly into the digital space and are working with um, organizations like Darren uh, with Zero Light to drive that omni-channel, that customer channel experience. We see that there are different brands that are moving quickly with electric vehicles. Overall, is the, is the industry moving quick enough for what we as consumers want? I think today, no. Um, and I think this is the reason we're, we're discussing now, you know, how does the, the OEM work through the, the dealership networks and the, the connection to their customers? There is still, a, a, I think, a difference that needs to be bridged between the OEM and their brand proposition and the consumer. And I think as we've discussed already, and as you raised, George, you know, that the new generation of buyers or those who want to engage in, in the use of vehicles are looking for different routes. And I, I don't think yet the industry is caught up um, because of the legacy, because of the structure of how automotive brands come to market today, there is still a lot of barriers uh, to the point that Dave made earlier. Um, uh, you know, there's a lot of barriers to how we move forward and, and how we bridge the gap. So yeah. I think there's a lot more they need to do to, to speed up the process, to make those changes, to bring the product to the clients more effectively. Yeah, I think it's also an issue of, uh, you know, especially young digital savvy consumers expect a certain level of experience across all of their brand interaction. So it's not like it's not just about like they're going to buy fashion this way and they're going to buy beauty this way and they're going to buy groceries this way. They want the the same experience, whether they're banking, making an appointment with their doctor or buying a car. They want that leveled consumer experience that's consistent across what they're used to in order to feel confident and trust the brand, right? And I think it was, you know, Seamus, your point of this, the, the dealership kind of coming in between. Consumers today are expecting direct connection to brands. I mean, when you think about big, you know, incredibly successful popular brands that maybe, you know, obviously outside of the automotive sector, things like Nike, those are emotional purchases. Those are the same kind of emotional triggers that you, you buy anything with, you know, and these brands really know how to connect in a meaningful way with their customers. And it seems like the auto industry has a very, uh, an old model that is beginning to evolve, obviously. Yeah, I think they're definitely, uh, I think, I think what, they're, what they're definitely doing is, is fundamentally cars are becoming iPhones on wheels. And what happens is, and what and what happens is people will judge the technology in their customer journey as being representative of the technology in the vehicle. Very so if you point. have a very poor customer journey, you're going to think if they've got a website website with a few static images that doesn't work and doesn't function and I have to wait, you're not going to think that the UI UX experience in the vehicle is going to be outstanding. So pretty much people are deciding online. They're not even making it to the dealerships and hence why there's been that huge drop off. And I think OEMs need to think of say the websites and other interaction with consumers is actually being their best sales tool. And, and, and in actual fact, that's where the battle, that's where the battleground is because by the time they walk through the door of that dealer, you know, that they've made the mind up. Yeah, well, I mean, I think your point about the digital world and the digital component, I mean, I shouldn't even, you know, you know better than I do in terms of the world of gaming and how influential that is in terms of how people perceive brands. 
you know, there's all kinds of consumer brands that are moving onto the gaming platform and selling virtual products to the avatars in those in those brands. And you know, let's take a, a, a game like you know Grand Theft Auto and the perception of luxury automobiles with the younger high net worth individual. I mean, we personally work with Bentley, for example, and uh, you know, brands like Maserati have far outpaced brand Halo simply because of the value of that brand within the game. Uh, and so, you know, we cannot underestimate the virtual aspect of, of what the brand value brings. Yeah, and I think, I mean, obviously it, it, our background is in, it, it, it is in the computer games industry, but what people don't realize about the computer games industry is it, it is underpinned with data. So even if you take something really simple like Candy Crush, you know, the free to play online mobile phone game, they're watching what the consumers are doing every single second. And if a consumer gets stuck on level 20 and starts dropping off and not monetizing, literally alarm bells go off in the building saying, make level 20 easier, we're, we're losing people and we're losing money. And I think that whole data-driven mentality has yet to, is yet to hit automotive in terms of allowing people to understand the consumer and personalize the experience. I think you make it a good point as well, Darren, though, about the the technology being associated with the sales tool. And, uh, you know, if you don't have a good technical experience or you can't understand through the sales tool what you're buying into, um, that that represents that representation as you raise between the, the technology in the vehicle and, and the way that the vehicle is presented, the way that the selling cycle uh, is run. Um, it's a really interesting point because you, you don't want to downgrade the value of the offer because your sales tools are not really delivering that experience. Uh, and you make that association, poor experience online, poor experience in the dealership must therefore be not a great proposition. Poor product, yeah. yeah. Which which brings us to the, is there someone that wanted to say something? I was, uh, I was just going to, yeah, I was just going to say, listening to you guys in the last sort of five minutes is really interesting in the sense that I've just been picking up on, on some, some real um, spread in this industry. Like, I, um, Darren's exactly right about iPhone on wheels. That's how I'd always describe my Tesla because it's completely different to getting into a Mercedes EQC, which is like getting into a, by con by contrast, getting into a cockpit of an aeroplane. There's buttons everywhere. I get my Tesla, there's one screen. Yeah, it's a completely different, a completely different experience. And I think um, similarly, I, you know, in the last few months, we've experienced customers that I've always had an Audi, I'm going to have an e-tron. I've always had a Mercedes, I've got an EQC because they're brand, they're really brand loyal. But then there's a huge swathe of people that just go, I used to have a petrol, now I want an electric. I don't care which one, I just want to work it out. So I think, again, that's, that's a diversity of, of the industry. And then the third point was to one of them, something Jonathan said about, um, oh, what was it? Um, uh, yeah, about the different types of automotive um, changes they've got to go through. And I have some degree of sympathy because it takes such a long time to go from uh, designing a vehicle to actually selling it. But some of the automotive have just gone electric only straight away. Some of them have been forced into it, like Dieselgate, for example, um, and others that are selling things like plug-in hybrids and self-charging hybrids, which is effectively false advertising because you're selling something that doesn't exist. So there's a huge, huge, in all those different sort of scenarios, there's a huge broad breadth of, of, of the market now, whereas it used to be a lot more linear, I think. Just observations, really. Yeah, th thank you. Which brings us to our, our, our last question uh, to the group, um, which is, uh, what does an in-store, a meaningful in-store experience look like today for a car dealership? And uh, Seamus, I'd like to pose that question to you, uh, and then of course open it up to the group. Okay, well, I think first and foremost, not just about selling cars anymore. So it must offer something that's broader than that in terms of the experience. It must be thematically aligned with the brand. And I still think that applies even if it's a multi-branded retail space, such as a grid sale. Um, but it's for the brand to understand you know, what is their purpose and how do we make sure that lines up with our consumers' lifestyles. Um, but your physical retail footprint as a brand is your opportunity to make that connection with the customer. And this is why I say, again, it's not just about selling a car. It's everything else you're going to put around that. Um, so in quite general terms, that means your, your retail space can be also at the same time an event space, a meeting place, an entertainment venue, a, a service center, 
all of these things even more. And so I think we'll see business models adapt to that. Inherently, then, the retail footprint will have to start adapting to that as well to support more varied usage in a practical way. And so you ask, what does it look like? Um, from an LG point of view, we would say that that means some of your fixtures and fittings will actually be digital. You won't have a, a wall. You will have a display in place of a wall. Um, that may be a totally seamless LED display, for example. Um, you might not have all of your windows be windows. Some of them might be a transparent display. So that what this gives you, um, combined with audio throughout, of course, is uh, an instantaneous transition from one purpose to another. So we're going to be a retail space now, but we're holding an event here later on that might be a music-based event, for example. It gives you that instant transformation it's much easier, but could also be centrally managed. And this is where I go back to a previous point where the future of some dealership is to move closer to the OEM. So if you are a dealership for that particular OEM, you may end up handing over a certain amount of control for that sort of experience to be more centrally managed. But you'll get the benefit of being the place to go for consumers who feel themselves aligned with that brand. Um, and I think that's one of the physical changes and then the business model changes we'll start seeing over the next few years, more than we have done already. I think, Seamus, to that point, you know, we, we're looking at and, and working with brands who are moving away from the dealership being a point of sale. And it goes back to what Darren said, that, you know, the, the people that they're employing are not sales driven. Um, it goes back to having the agency model where, that there is no commission based in that network. It's then about presenting the brand and presenting the product because the rest of it is mapped out. And that then enables a level set between the online and the physical experience. And then we're about then driving more meaningful experience because you're going to a physical place, not to be engaged by it to sell, but to be engaged to experience. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, the future of consumption in general is about that emotive aspect. It's that emotional engagement uh, with the product. You know, the, uh, and I think the auto industry, unfortunately, has not really kept pace up until this point where I think it's, you know, being forced to simply because there's a huge generational shift happening in terms of how people buy. Would anyone I else think like people are, I was just going to say, people are just a lot more brand mobile. So yeah. nowadays, you know, it's 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 the the days of the uh, allegiances are, are are sort of behind us now, and I think and I think there's it's almost like COVID has been COVID has just been an accelerant to what was going to happen anyway. It seems home home working accelerant, you know, the evolution in the dealerships accelerant, online purchasing accelerant, and I think it's the good news is is although the door behind us has shut. The door to the future hasn't, the, in terms of what's going to come, hasn't been defined yet. But I would, I would certainly say, I mean, it's it's great news for for Mood and for and for Seamus is that obviously car manufacturers are willing to spend a lot of money putting hardware in there, to, to which is great. But what happens is they need to think longer and harder about what's the experience, the software experience, or whatever experience it is that's going to be in there that's going to make me want to go to a dealership because I can find out about the car online, I can specify it online, I can understand it online, and I just want to buy and I don't want the hassle. Would anyone else like to comment on that? Because I think, again, you know, the COVID, the acceleration of digital purchasing. Uh, across multi-generation because in prior obviously people who were more comfortable using digital tools were you know were more uh, disposed to purchasing online versus in a uh, quote-unquote older generation now everyone has because of covid been forced to use digital purchasing um how do you think um any of you would like to respond how do you think that's going to change how people actually buy cars do you think that they need to physically see those automobiles or do you think it's something that will happen online through virtual technology? I think that the best data point we have is we were um, worked a lot with Audi City, the digital dealerships that Audi had starting about 2014. It started the whole Audi City, Audi City movement, and unbelievably, 50% of people 
who bought a car from an Audi City dealership didn't take a test drive. Wow. And, and if you and if you think about it, it it's it, it's it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a very very interesting statistic. But if you think about it, it if if this is the third Audi A3 that you've purchased, do you re, and you and 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 you can understand what you're buying. Do you really need? Do you really need to buy to actually take a test drive? So where do and they take it, that car? Is the car delivered to them? I, I mean, obviously, there's a huge amount of customization options than if you can buy it digitally, right? Because you can then just wait for it to be made. Yeah. So, 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 so obviously, there's. I think there's always a need for a physical vehicle. You, you need to see and understand a, a physical vehicle. However, that physical vehicle, talking about personalization, is not your vehicle. It's it's that one over there is in black. Yours is going to be silver. It's got the light interior. Yours will be dark, and all etc. 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 So what software can do is show you your exact car, fully personalized, uh, and, and allows you to visualize what you what you what you're going to get. So what Audi City do, if you wanted to take a test drive, they've got a local dealer to bring the car to the Audi City store, and you just went and you just went off on it. But I think in future it's going to be it's going to be really really easy for them to have a fleet of vehicles and they just bring the car at the door and leave it again much more rather than the pressure of having a salesperson sitting next to you judging your driving during the test drive. Just here's the car, have it for 24 hours, live with it, see what you think. Wow, big transformation. Any other comments? We have some questions from the audience that we maybe we should be responding to, but are there any other comments on on this about the retail, the future of, of automotive retail? So we have a question from. Uh, oh, go ahead, Seamus. Yeah, I was going to add one last thing on there, um, and it was that I returned to it time and again in in this session because I think it is so important that. There are brands who are changing their business models so that it becomes more of a membership focus. And I think what that is going to mean for the dealers is that they should try and encourage people to visit who aren't necessarily looking to buy a car in that visit. So what else are they looking to do? And that is still within the automotive industry, a great big question mark. What are we going to offer people and what would they come here to do? And we talk about the brand loyalty disappearing, and it absolutely is, but that's one way that you can reinforce that and bring it back as an OEM. Um, and it's still the great big untapped piece, I think, of, of automotive retail. Um, and I'll leave it there open-ended as it is still a question mark. I know we'll explore it a bit on the next session, um, but that's what it will come down to in the end, I think, between who is successful and who is not so. Great. Uh, well, we have a, a comment all the way from from Chile. I'm not sure if it's from Santiago, but um, a lovely place. Um, and it says here, uh, here in Chile, for example, everything about cars is still not very digital. A store, service, support, insurance, etc. How do you see uh, the future of this industry in less developed markets? Uh, will there be a, a big gap in the next 10 years? It's a really good question. Yeah, I think it is. I might take and make a comment on that. <clears throat> I think it goes to the point of the, the speed at which the, the industry can move. I think we are starting to see the industry and certain OEMs moving very, very quickly now to, to, to be able to standardize the experience of, uh, of engaging with the brand worldwide. And I think the, the breakdown or the, the decoupling of the dealer network and the, and the OEMs go to market approach will speed up. Um, and, and enable markets that maybe traditionally have lagged behind with their approach to engaging with automotive brands, that will narrow. So I think that we'll see a lot more speed of change in some of the and some of the um, in some of the less and mid-sized markets more quickly going forward. Yeah, I think if anything, from from our experience, it's almost like the the um, countries like Chile. Are actually the ones that are accelerating the process bizarrely. Not, not they're not actually lagging. Generally, lagging behind. So if you go to say the multi dealers in China, for instance, you know the things about online purchasing that are, that are going on in China. If you go to a, a dealer, a dealer in India, they literally go out the back and fit the accessories to the car, and then you drive off in it. 
So you, you personalize the car at the front and they're fixing it up at the back. So, so I think that sort of stuff is those without a preconceived idea can move faster. And so I think if anything, you might see the, the those countries actually leading the way, hopefully. I was, point, I was gonna make a point, Darren. Yeah, sorry, Jonathan. I was gonna make a point actually, Darren, you just touched on as well, is is this new generation of, of vehicle type, this EV. Um, we haven't talked about it yet, but they 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 don't need a lot of servicing or maintenance. You know, they just keep going. You know, I've lost three EVs I've had. The only material thing I've had to change is the tires. You know, it's nothing to do with the EV. It's wow. you know, so you know, it's in perhaps less developed world where where the where there's a huge, well, indeed here or everywhere else, you know, there's a huge element of, of repairing and maintaining these internal combustion engines that won't be needed in the future, because these vehicles just would, would have so few moving parts. And perhaps that might help, you know, bridge the gap a little bit in terms of that particular part of the whole automotive journey is going to be a far more simplistic one going forwards than it, it perhaps um, has been in the past. So I had a question for you, Sam, specifically, specifically in this area is if you think about all the billions of gallons of fossil fuels that are burned every single day in, in combustion engines, is the electricity generation network able to cope? Oh, I like that question. I get asked that a lot, um, and it's it's a good one. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the it's use UK as an example. Um, in 2002, in the UK, we used 16% more electricity than we do today. Um, and that's because all of our electronic information and all the way that we, all our smart technology, et cetera, is getting more efficient. So we're using up less energy than we used to. If in the UK, and this is an impossible situation, but if everybody was to turn into an EV or have an EV tomorrow, then that would increase the capacity requirements on the grid by 10%. So we were 16% worse off uh, nearly 18 years ago. If everyone changed to EV tomorrow, we'd still be within the thresholds that we were managing a couple of decades ago. The, the bigger question is around timing of energy, not necessarily whether we've got the capacity for it. So we definitely have already proved two decades ago that we can deal with that level of power. It's what the tricky thing is, everyone returning home at five or six o'clock in the evening and plugging their EVs in, that creates more of a challenge. And that's where smart energy and, and, and time of use tariffs and maybe even legislation which prevents us from being able to charge at certain times of day, when frankly we wouldn't want to anyway because electricity is more expensive, so everyone starts to defer some of the energy that they need into the two, three, four o'clock in the morning when you're fast asleep, then we can keep the grid, we can spread the power around and that will be fine. So it's more a case of the timing of, of when we utilize this energy, not as not whether or not we have enough of it. And of course, there's a huge amount more renewable energy now than there was back in 20 years ago as well. So that's another positive element. So all of this stuff is just, it's not on the tailpipe, it's in the coal powered station, but it's certainly in the UK, you know, we've got huge amounts of solar, huge amounts of wind and renewable energy now. Um, so yeah, it's it's one of the common myths that gets asked a lot, which I always look forward to dispelling when it when it gets asked. Yeah, great, yeah. great answer. To be honest, great answer. Yeah. We've got we've got ten more minutes, and I, I want to make sure that we answer some of the questions from the audience. We're getting quite a few. Um, uh, to the panel, uh, if we all work at home, do we want to own vehicles in the future? Very good question. Will it become a higher as you go model? Yes, <laughs> not for everyone, but. Yes, that will become very popular, popular I think. Um, and you may have one vehicle that is owned or leased, but actually is shared by a whole um, extended family. So I don't just mean the family who live together, but I mean the whole family who might each live an hour away from each other, are all more or less sharing a same, the same vehicle, more ride sharing. Um, yeah, I, I think. Uh, a desire to own outright will decrease significantly and there will be different sort of models spring up around that without doubt. And I think that that adds and maybe uh, the panel would like to respond to this. The whole brand question then comes into play, right? Because if you don't, like I know for one, I don't have a, I live in Amsterdam, I bike everywhere I need to go. And then if I need to go somewhere far uh, and, and independently, I'll rent a car, but I, I enjoy renting BMWs just because I'm familiar with the interior and it's sort of the brand I rent, you know? Um, so I think, what do you think brands, how do you think brands are going to be able to cope with this idea of, of maybe, you know, consumers not owning the vehicle, but leasing or borrowing the vehicle for a short period of time? How do you think they can then adapt to creating brand loyalty around that so that their brand is chosen consistently? 
I think that's a great question, George. And I think, um, you know, one of the, the topics you think about around that is how do you actually personalize the extra vehicle uh, on, a, on a more regular basis? How, how can you make that vehicle personalized to you when you're driving it? Um, you know, that brand loyalty, that decoupling of the brand itself from the product then turns into, well, how can I use that brand to represent me as a consumer? How can I put my personality onto that vehicle in real time to be able to make it mine, to differentiate? So you, you, you decouple that, I'm, I'm using a particular brand's vehicle because that's what I'm used to using or because I like that brand. I'm actually moving now to use a vehicle because I can personalize it in real time. I think that's Very gonna be an interesting part of the market going forward. Very good point. Uh, we have a question for Sam specifically. It says, uh, hi there, uh, Salaman here from EV Lab, who is a developing, who's developing a multi-brand EV dealership in Dubai. This is for Sam. Uh, how did the buying trends locally in the UK dictate the development of the EV sales product in GridServe? Sorry, I didn't quite catch the first half of the question, George. How did the what, sorry? uh let me see how did the buying trends locally in the uk dictate the development of the ev sales product in gridserve how did the buying trades dictate buying trends dictate? trend yeah um i still don't know i fully understand the question to be honest um Might i think be. I think what the gentleman is asking uh, is uh, how did the the uh, how did the, the trends of the consumers dictate the offer that you were creating for GridServe in the UK? Okay. Um, well, I mean, I guess the trend in an overall perspective is is towards EVs away from from ICE vehicles. So the the the, the thing we're developing is a is a is an infrastructure to support the, the trend that is going away from petrol and into into electric. Um, and then we've got to try and assess, as we do with all our sites, try and assess the market and the target audience, both locally and nationally. So, you know, the first site behind me on the wall there is in Braintree and Essex. So we, we, you know, we know the local demographic, we know the local population size, we know the footfall of traffic, we know how many cars are going past, what type of cars they are, how many people are in it. You know, again, et cetera, et cetera, what the grid connection is, you know, where, where our solar farm is located, all that stuff dictates where, where we think we should put them. Um, and, and then trying to tap into that local market and, and then the social media, the local media and targeting in such a way that, that appeases that, or not appeases, but, but yeah, targets that, that local interest in, in the right format to try and encourage them to come and use their, use the forecourt. And to one of Seamus's points earlier, you know, we might encourage people to come and use the forecourt because we've got a post office and a costa. Yeah. It might not be because we've got, we've got two electric vehicles in the showcase upstairs because we've got a car lift and that's great. Maybe we just want people to come in and use the site, you know, and then and then you know by osmosis, if you like, they're starting to go, what's upstairs? Or, you know, we have this Apple-esque um, arena, not a sales pitch arena like a dealership, but a, you know, an Apple-esque approach to things and trying to get people to move towards this, or at least back of their mind that you know this is this is wow, this is the new world. You know, I must I'm gonna have to get into get involved in that at some point in the future. And hopefully, you know, slowly but surely we can we can sort of massage the local area and educate again, just keep saying it, educate, you know, until they until they make that leap, make that step. Great. I don't know if that uh, answers the question, but I've tried. <laughs> Hopefully. Uh, we have five more minutes. Uh, we have a couple more questions. It says here, do you think an EV park on my drive solution will come to market soon, seeing the increase in EV sales? EV park on my driveway? Uh, as in sort of renting your car out or renting your driveway I, out? or I think a, a, an EV charging station on their drive, um, seeing, yeah. Do you think an EV park on my drive solution will come to market soon, seeing the increase in EV sales? That's the direct question. Yeah, I think there's a few companies in the UK that are trying to do something similar, um, but it's a challenge because I've got, my household's got two cars and I've got a driveway with two cars on it, you know, and so I don't know how someone would access that. And, and then there's a, the connectivity challenge in terms of when somebody else might be using yours and how do you build them for it, et cetera. So I think we might have to get a little bit more smart and more connected in terms of the way the vehicles communicate with the charger and communicate with the cloud before that starts to become a real, a real viable option. At the moment, there is very little connectivity. When you plug a car in on your driveway, it's only doing an electrical handshake for safety and then transferring power one way. It's not communicating in any other way. And um, so, 
unless you have some sort of telematics or something that's connecting connecting it all together in the cloud. So I think we probably need to go a little bit further down the line of, of multiple overarching connectivity between cars and chargers before that becomes a real viable option, in my opinion. Yeah. I think there's also there's two things that are there as well. One of them is the infrastructure, and the other is the development of the vehicles themselves. So battery technology is going to improve, capacity will increase, your time to charge will decrease. Um, and actually that helps those who are developing infrastructure um, because you can make your infrastructure smaller, suitable for more frequent visits, um, as in visits by a, a larger number of people, but they may be there for less time and they may have to go individually less often. Um, that opens an opportunity, how do you get more out of each visit? Um, but I think there's all sorts of things happening on, on both ends of that problem to tackle the issue that that um, the audience member has asked about that. Great. Well, I, we have three minutes left. Maybe we can squeeze one more question in uh, before we have to sign off. Uh, it says here, EV will cause energy delivery issues, then a more diverse energy solution is preferable. Uh, I, uh, for example, hydrogen, is there any other uh, sustainable energy source that will drive cars in the future? That's a big question. <laughs> well, I think hydrogen is obviously, um, it's there now. Toyota, Hyundai, they have both brought to market hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. Again, you have the question of infrastructure. I think um, some of the more traditional oil companies or vehicle fuel companies may actually find it easier within their own infrastructure to switch from uh, you know, fossil fuels into hydrogen. Um, certainly, a lot of the same companies who are who are um, developing green energy production are also looking at how they can produce green hydrogen. Um, so I think those are definitely the big two. Yeah. Great. Well, gentlemen, I, we have two more minutes. So I think it's time to sign off. Is there anything else you want to make a comment on before we say goodbye to our audience? Well. Thank you all very much. It was certainly a stimulating conversation. Um, and the audience, thank you very much for attending the meeting, I hope, or the session. I hope you found it informative and stimulating. Um, we will be sharing a white paper of this particular topic with the group uh, and a recording of the session. And an invite for the next session will go out uh, shortly next week. So we have uh, two more uh, automotive webinars, again, looking at the future of the automotive industry. Um, so we hope you will all join us next time. Uh, different panel, obviously, maybe even a different moderator, who knows. <laughs> Thank you all very much.